Chapters 1 to 5 of After Shortness of Life by Lucius Annius Seneca. Translated by Aubrey Stewart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. The greater part of mankind, my Paulinus, complains of the unkindness of nature because we are born only for a short space of time, and that this allotted period of life runs away so swiftly, nay, so hurriedly that with but few exceptions men's life comes to an end just as they are preparing to enjoy it. Nor is it only the common herd and the ignorant vulgar who mourn over this universal misfortune as they consider it to be. This reflection has run complaints even from great men. Hence comes that well-known saying of physicians, that art is long, but life is short. Hence arose that quarrel, so unbefitting a sage, which Aristotle picked with nature because she had indulged animals with such a length of days that some of them lived for ten or fifteen centuries, while man, although born for many and such great exploits, had the term of his existence cut so much shorter. We do not have a very short time assigned to us, but we lose a great deal of it. Life is long enough to carry out the most important projects. We have an ample portion, if we do but arrange the whole of it aright. But when it all runs to waste through luxury and carelessness, when it is not devoted to any good purpose, then at the last we are forced to feel that it is all over, although we never noticed how it glided away. Thus it is, we do not receive a short life, but we make it a short one, and we are not poor in days, but wasteful of them. When great and king-like riches fall into the hands of a bad master, they are dispersed straightway, but even a moderate fortune, when bestowed upon a wise guardian, increases by use. And in like manner, our life has great opportunities for one who knows how to dispose of it to the best advantage. Chapter 2 Chapter 2, Chapter two. Chapter two. Chapter two. Why do we complain of nature? She has dealt kindly with us. Life is long enough if you know how to use it. One man is possessed by an avarice which nothing can satisfy, another by a laborious diligence in doing what is totally useless, another is sodden by wine, another is benumbed by sloth, one man is exhausted by an ambition which makes him court the goodwill of others. Another, through his eagerness as a merchant, is led to visit every land and every sea by the hope of gain. Some are plagued by the love of soldiering, and are always either endangering other men's lives, or in trembling for their own. Some wear away their lives in that voluntary slavery, the unrequited service of great men. Many are occupied either in laying claim to other men's fortune, or in complaining of their own. A great number have no settled purpose, and are tossed from one new scheme to another, by a rambling, inconsistent, dissatisfied, fickle habit of mind. Some care for no object sufficiently to try to attain it, but lie lazily, yawning until their fate comes upon them. So I cannot doubt the truth of that verse, which the greatest of poets has dressed in the guise of an oracular response. We live a small part only of our lives. But all duration is time, not life. Vices press upon us and surround us on every side, and do not permit us to regain our feet, or to raise our eyes and gaze upon truth. But when we are down, keep us prostrate and chained to low desires. Men who are in this condition are never allowed to come to themselves. If ever by chance they obtain any rest, they roll to and fro like the deep sea, which heaves and tosses after a gale. And they never have any respite from their lusts. Do you suppose that I speak of those whose ills are notorious? Nay, look at those whose prosperity all men run to see. They are choked by their own good things. To how many men do riches prove a heavy burden? How many men's eloquence and continual desire to display their own cleverness has cost them their lives? How many are sallow with constant sensual indulgence? How many have no freedom left them by the tribe of clients that surges around them? Look through all these, from the lowest to the highest, this man calls his friends to support him, this one is present in court, this one is the defendant, this one pleads for him, this one is on the jury, but no one lays claim to his own self. Everyone wastes his time over someone else. Investigate those men whose names are in everyone's mouth. You will find that they bear just the same marks. A is devoted to B and B to C. No one belongs to himself. Moreover, some men are full of most irrational anger. They complain of the insolence of their chiefs because they have not granted them an audience when they wished for it, as if a man had any right to complain of being so haughtily shut out by another, when he never has leisure to give his own conscience a hearing. This chief of yours, whoever he is, 
though he may look at you in an offensive manner, still will someday look at you, open his ears to your words, and give you a seat by his side. You never designed to look upon yourself, to listen to your own grievances. You ought not, then, to claim these services from another, especially since, while you yourself were doing so, you did not wish for an interview with another man, but were not able to obtain one with yourself. Chapter 3 Chapter 3 were all the brightest intellects of all time to employ themselves on this one subject, they never could sufficiently express their wonder at this blindness of men's minds. Men will not allow any one to establish himself upon their estates, and upon the most trifling dispute about the measuring of boundaries, they betake themselves to stones and cudgels. Yet they allow others to encroach upon their lives, nay, they themselves actually lead others into take possession of them. You cannot find any one who wants to distribute his money, Yet among how many people does every one distribute his life? Men covetously guard their property from waste, but when it comes to waste of time, they are most prodigal of that of which it would become them to be sparing. Let us take one of the elders and say to him, We perceive that you have arrived at the extreme limits of human life. You are in your hundredth year or even older. Reckon up your whole life in black and white. Tell us how much of your time has been spent on upon your creditors, how much on your mistress, how much on your king, how much on your clients, how much in quarrelling with your wife, how much in keeping your slaves in order, how much in running up and down the city on business. Add to this the diseases which we bring upon us with our own hands, and the time which is laid idle without any use having been made of it. You will see that you have not lived as many years as you count. Look back in your memory and see how often you have been consistent in your projects, how many days passed as you intended them to do when you were at your own disposal. How often you did not change colour, and your spirit did not quail. How much work you have done in so long a time. How many people have without your knowledge stolen parts of your life from you. How much you have lost. How large a part has been taken up by useless grief, foolish gladness, greedy desire, or polite conversation. How little of yourself is left to you. You will then perceive that you will die prematurely. What then is the reason of this? is that people live as though they would live for ever. You never remember your human frailty. You never notice how much of your time has already gone by. You spend it as though you had an abundant and overflowing store of it. Though all the while, that day which you devote to some man or to some thing is perhaps your last. You fear everything like mortals as you are, and yet you desire everything as if you were immortals. You will hear many men say, after my fiftieth year I will give myself up to leisure, my sixtieth shall be my last year of public office. And what guarantee have you that your life will last any longer? Who will let all this go on just as you have arranged it? Are you not ashamed to reserve only the leavings of your life for yourself, and to point for the enjoyment of your own right mind only that time which you cannot devote to any business? How late it is to begin life just when we have to be leaving it? What a foolish forgetfulness of our mortality! to put off wholesome counsels until our fiftieth or sixtieth year, and to choose that our lives shall begin at a point which few of us ever reach. Chapter 4 You will find that the most powerful and highly placed men let fall phrases in which they long for leisure, praise it, and prefer it to all the blessings which they enjoy. Sometimes they would fain descend from their lofty pedestal if it could be safely done. For fortune collapses by its own weight, without any shock or interference from without. The late Emperor Augustus, upon whom the gods bestowed more blessings than on anyone else, never ceased to pray for rest and exemption from the troubles of empire. He used to enliven his labours with the sweet though unreal consolation that he would some day live for himself alone. In a letter which he addressed to the Senate, after promising that his rest shall not be devoid of dignity nor discreditable to his former glories, I find the following words. These things, however, it is more honourable to do than to promise. But my eagerness for that time, so earnestly longed for, has led me to derive a certain pleasure from speaking about it, though the reality is still far distant. He thought leisure so important, that though he could not actually enjoy it, yet he did so by anticipation and by thinking about it. He who saw everything depending upon himself alone, who swayed the fortunes of men and of nations, thought that his happiest day would be that on which he laid aside his greatness. He knew by experience how much labour was involved in that glory that shone through all lands, and how much secret anxiety was concealed within it. 
He had been forced to assert his rights by war, first with his countrymen, next with his colleagues, and lastly with his own relations, and had shed blood both by sea and by land. After marching his troops under arms through Macedonia, Sicily, Egypt, Syria, Asia Minor, and almost all the countries of the world, when they were wary with slaughtering Romans, he had directed them against a foreign foe, while he was pacifying the Alpine regions and subduing the enemies whom he found in the midst of the Roman Empire, while he was extending its boundaries beyond the Rhine, the Euphrates and the Danube, but Rome itself, the swords of Marina, Scipio, Lepidus, Ignatius, and others were being sharpened to slay him. Scarcely had he escaped from their plot, when his already failing age was terrified by his daughter, and all the noble youths who were pledged to her caused by adultery of her by way of oath of fidelity. Then there was Paulus and Antonius's mistress, a second time to be feared by Rome, and when he had cut out these ulcers from his very limbs, others grew in their place. The empire, like a body overloaded with blood, was always breaking out somewhere. For this reason he longed for leisure. All his labours were based upon hopes and thoughts of leisure. This was the wish of him who could accomplish the wishes of all other men. Chapter 5, Chapter five. Chapter five. While tossed hither and thither by Catiline and Clodius, Pompeius and Crassus, by some open enemies and some doubtful friends, while he struggled with the struggling republic, and kept it from going to ruin, when at last he was banished, being neither able to keep silence in prosperity, nor to endure adversity with patience. How often must Marcus Cicero have cursed that consulship of his, which he never ceased to praise, and which nevertheless deserved it? What piteous expressions he uses in a letter to Atticus, when Pompeius the father had been defeated, and his son was recruiting his shattered forces in Spain. Do you ask, writes he, what I am doing here? I am living in my Tusculan villa, almost as a prisoner. He adds more afterwards, wherein he laments his former life, complains of the present, and despairs of the future. Cicero called himself half a prisoner, but by Hercules, the wise man never would have come under so lowly a title. He never would be half a prisoner, but would always enjoy complete and entire liberty, being free in his own power, and greater than all others. For what can be greater than the man who is greater than fortune? End of chapters 1 to 5